everybody, and welcome back to the Dowie Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Bentley. Today, my guest is somebody that's going to be familiar to a lot of our viewers and listeners. Tim Cartmel is an author and translator of several works, including A Study of Taiji Chuan by Sun Lutong, Xingyi Neigong, Principles, Analysis, and Applications of Effortless Combat Throws, Passing the Guard, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Details and Techniques with Ed Beneville, and others. In addition to his literary pursuits, Tim is a two-time Asian full contact champion, a submissions grappling champion, a two-time Pan American BJJ champion, and a seven-time winner of the Copa Pacifica de Jiu-Jitsu. He is a fourth degree black belt in BJJ and a professional MMA coach and head instructor of the Ace Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Fountain Valley, California. Tim, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So, I'm pretty familiar with you, but just in case some of our viewers aren't, could you uh, give us like an introduction to how you became involved in the martial arts to begin with? Um, I was always interested as a child and uh, like like most kids in my generation, I watched the Kung Fu series when I was little. So, you know, I was infatuated with that whole uh, uh, idea. So I started practicing uh, Kung Fu San Su when I was about 11. And that was my... Um, first start, I, I trained in that for about 12 years until I went to uh, the Republic of China, went to Taiwan to train, to continue training. So I trained in Taiwan and the mainland, mainland China for the next 11 years. And I practiced the internal styles and then fought in some Sanda. And then I came back um, mid nine, uh, 1990s and um, started uh, practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and some other grappling styles. And then stuck with that, and and uh, um, I've, I so I opened an academy when I came back, and I taught at first I taught things separately, and eventually I just started teaching a MMA program, and then about ten or years years or so years ago I closed my original school and I went to to work with a couple of my old friends who were also black belts in jiu-jitsu and we opened up the, the, the ace academy and uh i've been teaching brazilian jiu-jitsu and and i coach mma fighters that's my kind of my day job and then i still teach the traditional um chinese styles in privates and i do a number of seminars right and i competed i started competing uh in jiu-jitsu and submissions grappling uh, you know soon after i started training and um now i just now i just coach yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So um, I, I also studied, I started around the same age that you did, probably for the same reasons, I guess, you know, m- most kids, you know, I, I was a I was a smaller kid, you know, and I needed to learn to protect myself. And I, I do remember when I was a kid reading, you know, Inside Kung Fu and Black Belt Magazine and stuff like that, that uh, Kung Fu Sansu was considered a very practical form of, of Kung Fu. You know, it was very self-defense oriented. Yeah, exactly. Is that why you sought that art out or was that just what was available where you were at? No, I, you know, I did, I did do Taekwondo first, like every child, especially <laughs> in California. You know, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't know anything about martial arts and, and I did it for, I don't know, maybe less than a year. And, and I, it was, I liked it. It was fun, but um, I, I, I was always looking around and there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of a variety of Kung Fu that you could train then. Um, but there were different styles around. But when I, I saw, I literally, uh, I think my dad took me one. I was probably still 11 or 12 to one of the Sansu schools. And it looked much more like real real fighting, you know, the way they were training. Yeah. And I was like, ah, I want to do this. It wasn't even because it was Kung Fu. It was just, you know, I didn't I didn't know a lot about martial. I'd literally heard of Taekwondo, Karate, and Kung Fu. And Ju- I probably heard of Judo, you know, as a kid. And, uh, you know, the way they trained, I, I, I really, it just appealed to me. And that's the, that's the reason I went. It was more for the... It's kind of self-defense and the, the fighting aspect of it. So even at that age, you were pretty aware that you had to pressure test yourself in some way in order for it to be of a value to you. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, like I always say, there, there are lots of reasons to do martial arts. You know, you can do them for all kinds of reasons for health. You like the, the discipline or whatever the reason is, you know, and, but you have to be honest with yourself as, as to what your, your goal is and what you're really learning. And um, I didn't really care about, uh, at the time anyway, I mean, I, I understand the value of a lot of other kinds of training later, but, you know, they would make us do forms. And, and I didn't understand any of that back then. I just wanted to learn the techniques and then practice sparring, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So that was really the appeal. So how far along were you in your Kung Fu Sansu when you uh, went to Taiwan? 
so the grandmaster uh, Jimmy Wu, he 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 came up with the belt system. Kind of mm-hmm. he he originally, you know, when he was I I guess first year from China, he he taught um, uh, privately, you know, other Chinese people in LA. And then he opened up a commercial school. I'm not sure of the years in Omani. I, I trained there with him for several years too. And he eventually created a belt system because everyone had one. And, and it's not only good for business, it's good. It's an, it's an easier, much easier way to um, kind of um, organize your, your teaching because you can tell what rank someone's at or like what level more or less, that kind of thing. Right. So in Sun Tzu, they're colored belts. And if you get a black belt. If you, I would say an average would be probably four or five years of, you know, kind of serious training, you could get a black belt. And then you can get a degree every year after that, if you keep training. So, and then you get to the eighth degree, when you've been a black belt eight years, you get a, uh, what they consider a master's degree kind of in it. And so I got the master's degree, I think the year before I went to China. So you had quite a bit of experience. Yeah. I trained, I, you know, I trained, I mean, I was into it and I was Mm -hmm. pretty much, so I trained virtually every day from being a kid until I was, I guess I was 23 when I left. Yeah. So what took you to Taiwan? Was it specifically for martial arts that you went there or were you, were you studying yeah. Chinese or? Yeah. No. no. So I to, at, the, at the time, um, you know, I wanted to continue my studies of Chinese martial arts, you know, like, like you just mentioned inside Kung Fu, you know, so I read the magazines and books. And so my, you know, my whole background, I'd actually, I did, I did some things here as well. I boxed a little and wrestled a little, but you know, I was into the Chinese martial arts, obviously primarily. So uh, the mainland at the time was not not so open to go and train, right. and, and uh, w- wushu was was very much promoted at the time. Yeah, and I wanted to do you know traditional martial arts. So Taiwan, there was the good thing about Taiwan was a lot of the top flight uh, Chinese martial artists fled the mainland to Taiwan. So there's a right. lot of really good martial arts there. Yeah. So you know that's I decided oh, I'll go to Taiwan. So after college, I I went. And then, uh, you know, I started, um, I, I had an introduction to uh, a teacher and I went and then um, I started training and I went to university there the, through the language program. So, you know, I learned to speak Mandarin and uh, I was going to stay. I, I, I originally thought, well, maybe, you know, three years, four years. And then I just got I just found more and more people to train with. Mm-hmm. So that that's how that went, and then I was I was particularly interested in in the kind of the the in, what you know we call now internal styles, um, just reading about them and hearing about them, and uh, I mean to be honest, just like here nowadays, it's difficult. It was difficult to find uh, internal style stylists that actually uh, uh, did any fight training. Mm. So it's mostly forms. I mean, a lot of good stuff, you know, I mean, about body mechanics and forms and, and there might be some push hands with the Tai Chi, but uh, it was hard to find um, fighters. So I was very lucky uh, in the beginning um, with, I, I started with uh, a master called Xu Hongji that practiced Xing Yi Tran. And, you know, the whole school was a fight school. Like all the training was geared towards, uh, comp- comp- not all of it, but a lot of it was geared towards competition. So that was a really good start. And then it's, you know, I was there longer. I met more teachers and found other people to train with. And then I started going to the mainland and training as well. So, um, I mean, there's some fantastic uh, fighters in the internal. They're just not not as common as, you know, maybe I would have hoped, I guess, at the time. Yeah. I, so Su Hongji, uh, his school also, did, did he not also have a, a, a ranked belt system? Did they use it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hong Yishan, his team. His teacher Hong Yishang um, started. He patterned it after karate. He, mm-hmm. as, I mean, as the story goes, um, he was invited. Hong Yishang was invited to Japan because he was a very famous Chinese martial artist, and Hong was also very famous as a fighter. And he was teaching in Japan, and, and they said he was very uh, impressed with the organization because Chinese martial arts there's no belts. I mean, right. there's a kind of hierarchy. Everyone you have, you know, you would call an older student like you know your older. Or yeah, brother. Style, but there was no real rank so there's there was no testing or ranking in most most schools and um it, you know as as, the, as i was told hong hong very much liked like that kind of organization and he liked the karate gi because they were cheap and ubiquitous right you could buy a you had an actual uniform you could put your logo on right and, uh, he, he came up with a, a, a belt system same with with colored belts 
and then a black belt. But the I always felt I always felt it was very well done. There weren't that many belts. It wasn't like you're just you know buying belts every few wow. months. And there was testing at every level. I mean, you had to show. I can remember the very the very first belt. You know, you had you had to demonstrate um, a certain number of forms, and then you had to explain the whole logic behind the form. And then you had to spar, right? So at every level, it, it was more and more stuff. And so I felt, I, I felt that was uh, extremely uh, useful and, and and a really good addition to the to the training. And then they have uh, their own tournaments, and then you know you can be right, you can fight according to your belt level. So it wasn't like Sanda a lot of the, the like the city tournaments or the the other tournaments. You know, you just fought at your weight. So, you know, you might have said, oh, I've trained here, I'll give it a try. And the other guy might have trained, you know, I don't know, 10 years, who knows. But his, when he had, they had their own, like, uh, within that system tournaments, you know, you could be divided by belt rank. So um, it encouraged newer students to start fighting earlier, which I feel is is paramount, like, to your development, you know. So, you know, you might be, uh, whatever, a lower belt, but you fight someone of the same belt rank. So, you know, you it was fair. And right. it, you're less likely to say, well, I've got to train a few more years. You know, you, it's that you're missing all that that early experience. Right. So, yeah, Hong, Hong had it and Xu Hongji, you know, just can have the same the same system. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like a lot of people, I think, you know, um, I'm a little bit older, but a lot of younger people today don't realize that Sanda, at least back then, it was a it was fairly close to what we have for MMA today. I mean, I, I've yeah. seen like old videos where they were wearing basically like gardening gloves, you know, very yeah. thin like cotton gloves, no headgear, you know, just right. like a mouthpiece maybe and, and a groin right. protector. It was, it was pretty uh, pretty realistic for for what was around back then. Yeah, it was pretty much MMA um, with no ground fighting. Right. So if you, it's kind of like the old, you know, the idea of late high, like right. the platform yeah. fights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might be on a mat or in a ring and sometimes they're a race, depend, but if you push someone out of bounds, you got points. That was a big thing. And which is good because, you know, it makes you watch your environment. You know, you can't hit the cage or the ropes, you know, you're supposed to watch your environment and then, you know, throws, you get points for various, uh, there was a point system for throwing, but once it hit the ground, it was, you know, there was no ground fighting, but other than that, it was fairly, yeah, there, there weren't like, we were allowed to knee and elbow, you know, punch, kick, throw. It was, there were some, some rules against uh certain kind, you can't spike someone on the head, just like MMA in a throw right. and you couldn't poke with your fingers, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but other, otherwise, yeah, it was pretty much just stand-up free fighting. So how long had you been training with Su Hongji before you, you you did your first fight? I only so I when I got I started training with uh Xu Hongji, I was there about eight months he passed away. And then I, I started I continued training with um, his son. And at the end of the first year, he put me in the first I I, I didn't I actually didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I had about a, uh, it was an open tournament. I had, you know, I had a background obviously in martial arts and Sansu and all that, but the, the Shinyi training, I, I had trained just under a year. And, uh, you know, I was like, maybe, maybe you train another year. That was, but he, you know, he, he was like, nah, you gotta, you know, you need to start now. Yeah. So I'd probably been training there uh, about 10 months or so, maybe I did my first tournament wow. and then it was good. It was good to, you know, a good experience just to, just to kind of go through that kind of, pressure and uh you know some there's some really good uh there's some really good fighters and i guess trained you know yeah. trained a lot uh seriously for those events too they weren't like people that kind of casually did martial arts and then signed up you know right so yeah. it was good so uh, were you very aware of Xingyi before you started training in taiwan was it something you read about it. yeah mm -hmm. yeah i'd read about it you know i read robert smith's books like right. you know the masters mm -hmm. of methods and inside kung fu i'd seen i'd seen shungji master Xi in like the magazines before yeah. And uh, I, I really didn't, again, I, I really didn't, not that I didn't care, but it, it wasn't like I was going over to train with a, sp a specific person at first or a specific style. I right. wanted to learn like, you know, fight skills. Right. And I, I was in, in uh, very interested in the internal kind of, you know, take on it from reading about it. So, you know, I trained with, uh, you know, quite a number of different people in different styles. It was it pretty much dependent on like their skill level and, and how much I could learn. Not so much like, oh, I really want to learn like X, you know, I didn't really have that idea. Yeah. So when you did come to competing, did you, um, how should I put this? Were you specifically trying to try out things from like, say, Xing Yi or throws from Bagua? Were you trying to like test those things specifically? Or did you sort of like fight more or less instinctively with, you know? No, I, I, I tried to, I tried, yeah, I tried to do what they showed me, you know, the, the yeah, strategy. Right. So 
I mean, you know, I had a background, so, you know, like basic throws and things were, were pretty, yeah, I mean, I already, I'd already done and all, but the Xingyi Chen uh, kind of uh, body, body mechanics, the body use and the uh, strategy was, was a lot different than what I'd done before. Yeah. So yeah, I tried to use it specifically. Plus, you know, that the fight training I did that was specific, specific to the tournaments was Xingyi you know, based on Shingen and Bagua, right? So yeah, I feel like, yeah, I was, I was, it was, you know, when I, when I look back on it too, it looks like, I mean, the first tournament, it looked like rudimentary Shingi trend, but you know, you could see the, already the, the training was, you know, had taken, taken effect. It's Shingi trend. I mean, all, all I mean, I, I don't want to sound, all martial arts are practical if they're done correctly and for, and, and they're applied as for what they're for, but Shingi trend is very, um, it's, it's so strong. It's I'm, and I don't want to say it's easy to learn. Like you know, I don't want to get yeah. the wrong impression, but it's it's so straightforward and practical. And everything, everything in Shinyi Tren that you you do in like a form or a drill it is exactly how you're going to apply it. Pretty much when you use it, there's no there's no kind of flourishes in the forms, or there's no fancy you know uh, showy techniques that you, you you. There might be maybe you're going to demonstrate. You might learn, but we didn't. You know, it was all about. Uh, practical use so I, I mean i knew kids that, that train in uh, college kids that train in the school that were they they wouldn't train a year and they they had no background at all and they'd fight and i mean it, you know it wasn't it wasn't a jackie chan movie but they look you can point out all the techniques you can name them even there was no crazy you know they already had uh very much like brazilian jiu-jitsu you can train someone in brazilian jiu-jitsu for several months and then have them compete in you know they're white belts but everything they do is brazilian jiu-jitsu they don't do they don't they don't you know go nuts and flail around and you know the, and right. I, a lot of martial arts i've seen people train a long long time and when you really put them under pressure it looks like they haven't trained a day in their life right so i don't think it's their fault i think it's the training methodology's fault so that was a one good thing about about shingy train and also um the the sparring you know, we spar we would spar every class in in uh different formats and the thing about that pressure testing i mean i think a lot of people that don't do it think well it makes you tough because you're getting hit there, there's there's all you get used to pressure but what it, it's besides besides giving you realistic um pressure it's a laboratory for you to see what you can really do right, right. so your teacher might be fantastic at something that you just can't for whatever maybe he's taller than you maybe he's quicker than you so you know you learn the range of technique but you have to you have to figure out what you can actually do depending on your your temperament for yeah. one, you know, your, your physical attributes, your size, your weight, you know what I mean? That kind of yeah. thing. So within any, within any specific style where everyone learns the exact same strategies and, and tactics and techniques, you still have your own game, right? Like right. when you know, grapplers, you know, they say they go to jiu-jitsu tournament, they'll be like, oh, that guy has, a, you know, a, a tight closed guard game. You know, you, you, it's, even though you're doing the same thing. Or Mike Tyson has he fights inside when he boxes. It's a different game than fighting outside, even though they're all boxing. So how do you, how do you develop a game that you can really use? You 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 can unless you you really do it right. So sure. so you know those kind of that kind of training very quickly you start to develop pr practical skills that you can actually use yourself. Yeah. So just because you know your teacher can do some fantastic thing he's trained since he was a baby doesn't mean you can ever do it. Right. Amen. So that all that you know all that that. Uh, I've, I've formed a lot of my early ideas on, on, uh, you know, tr my tr the training method, because I've trained every way you can possibly train. I feel, you know, more cooperatively, more, you know, things are deadly and then, you know, sparring and, and, uh, and, you know, I can tell you, I mean, it's clear to me what you need to do. If you want to run out of fight, you have to fight. Right. No two ways about it, I think. Yeah. So how long were you in Taiwan before you started making forays into, uh, China itself? The second year I was there to Beijing and um, I, my Mandarin was okay by then. I mean, I could get by, but uh, you know, I met some, I met some martial arts teachers. I didn't stay very long. But I went to the first couple trips and then I made the best connections. Um, Dan Miller, I don't know if you know about Dan, yeah. but Dan had a magazine called the Bagua Journal, like yeah. a, one of the best. I mean, it was, a, it was a, it was a great kind of journal anyway. It was really well, produced and it was probably one of the premier martial arts magazines at the time and so i met dan i worked i he i got he hired me to work for him uh, he, i met him in taiwan as and to go to this is now i've probably been in in taiwan i don't know maybe eight, eight, eight seven eight years by then and uh so i went to the mainland as as the translator so dan uh 
Dan had almost like magic access to a lot of famous people. All I had to do was call him and say, an American magazine wants to interview you. And it was like a golden ticket. People, you know, a lot of these guys were like, they'd hear American and, and a magazine, they, they thought I'll really get a good exposure. Oh, that's and great. So, yeah, we met. And then, then as I met more people, then I, I made more connections. So, you know, I met a lot of people. And then for the next several years, I'd go back and train with them. So in your um, Shingi Nagong book that you did with Dan Miller, which is a great book, uh, uh, there's a quite a nice preface. Uh, both of you guys wrote a, a forward or preface to the book where you sort of talked about the um, how the how the book came to be and how it's sort of a, a chance meeting, you know, led you like to the information. What, uh, a lot of people don't realize how much goes into something like that. Um, there were a lot of people involved. W what was your translation process like? Um, that, that books, I mean, I'm not saying that that's a really good book. It's, I mean, not, not just because, you know, we, we most of it from the information that, that I translated and Dan got interviewing and there was a lot of really good, uh, kind of the people that like traditional ideas and, and how they truly trained and that kind of thing. There's a lot in there. So we met Zhang Baoyang. He was the ex, uh, chairman of the Beijing Xingyi Train Association. And, um, he, he was a, Senior student Wang Ji, the 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 guy in the cover, right? right. The gentleman that looked to be 100. So right. we met Zhang Baoyang, and and uh, he was like this wealth of knowledge. He was, I mean, this is in the this is probably in the late 90s, maybe or early to probably the late 90s. So you know he was older then, so he'd been around a long time. And trained with Wang Ji was from the Qing Dynasty kind of thing. So right. he was like a like a, a wealth of knowledge, and a super nice gentleman, like really forthcoming with the information. He couldn't have been nicer. There was no, um, uh, no ulterior motive. He didn't want anything. He just really wanted to promote Xing Yi Chen, right? So yeah. he had all those pictures of Wang Ji. So, um, you know, we interviewed him pretty thoroughly over days, as I remember, you know, and um, I translated all the stuff for Dan. And and uh, I was impressed. So I was like, I'm going to go back. And I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and train with these guys sometime. And literally probably not a year later i was back in the mainland i was by myself traveling and i was in you know central china and i literally i mean this sounds like that they found the tai chi manuscripts in a salt store story right yeah i've heard that story it's true i was in a i was in a uh a bookstore that had all these old chinese books in it and i was looking you know at these like martial arts books and i found a book that that uh wang Ju's son had written about the nei gong and uh, I was like, wow, it was really thorough. And it had uh, more of the kind of old school information, like all the old poems about it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got the book and then I, um, you know, I called Dan and, and Dan was in the States. And I was like, I told him about the book and all. And Dan, Dan, Dan's like, wow, you know, maybe we, can you, tra can you translate it? And I, it was public domain. I was so, oh, yeah. um, so that's how it started. So anyway, I translated that book and then we went back again to Beijing and, and uh, interviewed Wang Ji Wu and took the pictures that are in the Nei Gong book of him and interviewed a whole bunch of the other teachers and then wrote, wrote uh, you know, we wrote some, Dan wrote the, the whole history and then I wrote some other, you know, some other kind of pointers, I guess, in there to help, try to help help it uh, convey the information. And then the rest is a combination of uh, the information we got from Zhang Baoyang and then, and then the, the stuff I translated from Wang Ji Wu's son. And it took us a, a year, maybe a year, I don't remember, a year and a half uh, to get it all put together. Yeah. yeah. It's a great book. And it, I mean, to, to my knowledge, I don't think that there's a book like that, another book like that in English on that specific of a subject. Um, yeah, I don't know. You, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's, it's a really good book. So yeah. during it's, the same time period that you met uh, Sun Lutong's uh, daughter? Uh, yeah. You? Yeah, we met... Um, I can't remember how I, we met her now, but wow. um, yeah, contact or how we got an introduction, but I, I contacted her and, and we went to interview her. And again, she was, I mean, she was like, you know, and I was like one of the nicest people you could ever meet and, and just an outstanding person and uh, also very forthcoming. She really, really just like wanted to promote her, her dad's martial arts. Right. And so uh, we spent quite a bit of time with her the first time we met her um you know uh just asking her questions I met, I met some of her students then and uh i asked if i could come back and train and she you know she was like sure so 
I started to go back every, you know, couple, three times a year for the next couple, three years, I guess. And, and uh, also I was training with um, a master called Leon Cochran. I'd met much earlier. So it was great. So I would go to train. They're all both in Beijing. So I would train with Leon Cochran and stay with him. And then I, I would train with, you know, uh, Madam Sun and her students. So that's, that's how we met her. So um, she was, I mean, she was great. Yeah. I imagine so. There's some great remembrances in the in the translation that you did of uh, Sun Lutong's study of Taiji Twin that, that she, uh, I guess, contributed for the book, like remembrance she had of her dad when she was a, a teenager, a young lady. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. She came with her brother. Yeah. She, so, you know, there's a lot of stories about uh, Sun Lutong. Um, very, they're like, you know, there were, there were uh, soap operas about him in China, you know, the, yeah. you know, he was, he was famous and, and all these stories. And it was interesting because she was really, I mean, if you'd, if I'd ask her uh, or we'd ask her, is this true? And it, you know, some crazy thing yeah. and she would, she would like do the like roll her eyes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, you'd think she'd be like, Oh yeah, my dad could, but she never did. It was very, she, she would be like, who could do that? You know? And then she would tell the real story. It was always based in truth though. There was always some kind of thing her dad did. that was very impressive that, you know, like the telephone game after a few tellings became, you know, super human but uh we it was interesting to hear because you know we were obviously big fans of his already and so it was interesting to hear kind of what the the real deal was so that That's was really a, amazing yeah it was a good time yeah he was uh he was pretty amazing enough without all the embellishments i think yeah, I mean, yeah exactly. not really need to exaggerate yeah you mentioned leon kitchen uh is there can you tell us a little bit about him uh, i i think he was your he was a bagua instructor correct Mostly Xing Yi Chen, and mostly then, so, Xing, okay. Bagua, right? And then most, mostly he mostly practiced Xing Yi Chen. So he, um, he was one of the most famous um, old generation uh, internal martial artists at the time when I met him, and he'd uh, he learned he, he was in the in the Nationalist Army, mm -hmm. uh, fought the Japanese, and then you know fought the communists kind of mm -hmm. thing back in the day. And uh, one, one of his superior officers was a famous Xing Yitran guy from the, you know, way back in the day. And, and uh, lead Swan Yi student, I believe. And he trained with him for years. And then I think he, he trained before that as well. So he, he was a famous for it, famous for Xing Yitran. And, uh, you know, as a war fighter for years and years. So, um, you know, like a guy who'd actually kind of done the business. Right. And, and uh, then he... Uh, Chan Tinghua, he lived with Chan Tinghua's uh, younger son for a couple of three years, did Bagua. So about as close to the source as you could get there for the Chang Bagua. And he'd done some Taiji and things as well. Uh, so super interesting guy. He, after, after the, the Guomingdang Lhasa War, he was imprisoned for 15 years. Right. Uh, he was on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. And he was fairly well known as a fighter. So I think made an example of and then uh, released from prison, but had to stay in the jail as a janitor for 15 years. So basically 30, 30 years of right. incarceration. Right. And then when he, it, you know, it took his toll on him mentally, I feel. And, uh, you know, when he got out, he, he uh, didn't have a lot of opportunities. He was kind of blacklisted from a lot yeah. of things. Right. So, you know, he, he taught, but he was, I mean, a lot of people came to train with him because he was that, you know, he was that guy. He was that good. So that was kind of his, his background. And I trained with him. Um, on and off for, for quite a few years. I used to go, I used to stay with him in, when I trained in Beijing and uh, probably the most interesting man I've ever met. Like just not, not because of the march, just overall, like the, the stories he had and the, you know, the way he was. And uh, um, also after having that kind of background, like super optimistic about things, like not bitter, just yeah. I, he was a very interesting guy. So um, I did some Bagua with him, mostly Xing Yi Chen, and, and it was very interesting being very old school and, he had. Oh, he also had a. He had a famous uh, lay type uh, platform match with some Japanese like judo guys during the occupation, and one beat beat a couple of them too. And that made him. I have I have a copy of the old article somewhere he, he had from the paper in like the forties uh, of this fight. So he was a fairly well known guy, and uh, the his shingi training was very interesting. And in that I done shingi for years and years then for, with several teachers, and it was. Um, uh, and again, not 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 to not belittle. It was very simple. It, it was super straightforward the way he taught. Uh, you know, some of the things I I'd learned before. You know, maybe you're in, for an example, like in Santi, you're standing in like you know kind of the stance, and they'd have you know 
and not they're not bad, but it'd be like you rotate your heels, you know, you pull up your your belly, you stretch your and he and he was like he would just kind of put me in the position and like pull my head up and he'd be like stand there. And if if I made any other kind of adjustment, he 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 would he would think everything it, it was it was superfluous. And then it, it, over time it, it simplified all my I feel like the movement became much more natural. And his techniques were straightforward. There was no surprisingly i thought too for being from that generation there's no talk about energies there was no talk about internal power like you know people talk about now it was there was none of that he had no concept of that almost like if you asked him it was just the way he learned come you know on the yeah. way up and it was based on you know learning how to move your body correctly and, and having a kind of a straightforward intent and that's all that's all there was to it and then you just practice i asked him one time um one of the last times i saw him if there really was uh, any secret to like Shin Yi Trent. Mm -hmm. And he said, Oh, of course. And that was, I was like, Oh, this is my lucky day. Right. And, uh, he said, I said, well, you know, you haven't told me, he goes, Oh, I have. And I said, well, what's the secret? He goes, well, he goes, you have to lift the crown of your head and you have to lengthen your spine. He went through, I said, Lakshya, that's, that's in the first page of every Shin Yi book. And he said, yeah, but no one reads that page. Yeah. So true. Yeah. They just jump into the forms and they want to learn how to, you know, do technique and stuff. And I was like, okay. So that had a big, big influence on my training then. I was like, oh, all right. I actually heard, uh, I saw an interview with Sun Jun, uh, Jian Yun where she said the exact same thing. Uh, the interviewers, Chinese interviewer, asked her what the secret to Xingyi was. And she said, I already told you, you have to like, you know, yeah. push up the, the crown of your head. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's just practice. So that that was, yeah. That I mean, that's, you know, there's that's the truth, right? There's really, right. You know, yeah. not, you know, correct practice is really, there's no shortcut, really. There's no, you know, mysterious anything. You just have to practice. Right. Day after day. So uh, another book that you wrote that that I'm a big fan of is uh, Effortless Combat Throws. I guess the, the the proper title is Principles, Analysis, and Application of Effortless Combat Throws. Um, it's pretentious, but it sounded good when I... I don't think so. I think it's descriptive. It's accurate. Uh, <laughs> this is a super... Uh, great book i really think it kind of belongs on every martial artist bookshelf regardless of what style and uh the reason why i like it so much is that even though that there's uh, techniques demonstrated in the book and, and also the video um the the principles that you talk about in there is something that gets maybe not discussed as in depth in other books um was that was that what you set out to do when you wrote the book was just try to concentrate on the actual principles of throwing to tell you the honest truth, I don't know if I've ever said this, but I wasn't going to have any techniques per se. And and uh, Dan Miller produced the book and he's like, Tim, no one buys a book without pictures. Martial yeah. arts, right? So I came up with those techniques uh, uh, the weekend that we took the pictures. So in all honesty, I just thought of, you know, like I wanted a variety of throws to emphasize. If I did the book again, I would put in probably different techniques, probably more common techniques and that kind of thing. But at the time, you know, I just thought, okay, I just have to come up with some techniques to illustrate the, the principle. So the book is the first part is the important part, you know, the, yeah. so it was just, just a little, pretty much a, a distillation of all the things that I learned and, and uh, obviously the way I understood it. And the only, the only thing really novel in there is I, I, at one, one point in my tr training, I'd been training for quite a while then, um, I, I, I favored throwing techniques, um, really for one reason, when I got, I got a number of you know, fights when I was younger and, and the fights, when I could close fast and throw the person down hard, I got hit a, in the, a lot less. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's important to learn how to kick and punch and all, but most fights go like, you know, I mean, most fights are kind of overhand, right. Haymaker, then you're in clinch range. And then, and, and you know, I, I, just, I figured out fairly young that, that, uh, people aren't, aren't they don't have great balance if they're not trained right. and they don't know how to fall and then you know they landed on concrete and i you know you put all that together and it was like i would much rather throw them down hard because you had a chance to fall up or run away as right. well now right. mobilize these so i was very very interested in throwing and uh and so, so i thought about it a lot you know when i when i in my own training like the bagua jang that kind of thing the sparring i would kind of emphasize trying to trying to close to, to the throw i really liked it and so I had, you know, I learned all the principles of it and, and all, and then one day I just, I just, I don't know how I, I thought of it. I was watching, uh, I think I was watching actually a Swai Jiao group, like a class. And, you know, I was, I was just watching the, the throws and, you know, they're all like kind of common throws. And then I, I was watching that person being thrown uh, more 
for some reason. I can't remember what my original idea was. And it occurred to me very quickly that people only people only fall in, in, in one of three trajectories in general, unless they just get knocked over or something, right? And then I, th I thought about it for a long time. And then I thought of all the throws that I knew. And then I was, you know, I, I, would, I was training and I went, oh, okay. And there were, so there were three kind of categorically, just three ways they fell. And then I shifted my entire focus from what I was doing to what, what I wanted them to do in, in space. Mm -hmm. So instead of like, I'm going to, now, of course you have to understand throws in the first place. It's not like you could just understand these principles and throw anyone, but I already knew, you know, I already knew how to throw to a certain extent. And I started to shift like when I'd be in like different uh, relationship with the, when I was sparring, like or, or whatever clinch I was in or whatever grips we had, like which way I can make, which way I can make them go into one of those trajectories with the least amount of effort. Right. And at my, it sort of made my game went up very quickly, my, my actual ability. And then I had, so I came up, you know, I started to kind of consolidate my, my theory and so that's that's novel to my book. I feel the way I, yeah. I approach it, but the actual principles. I mean, every 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 legit martial art with throws is, is going to say fundamental. You know, if you do Aikido, Judo, right. you know, you did, I mean, it, there's you know, it's not it's not. I came up with you know magic throwing technique. It's it's the the principle. But you're right. I think a lot of people uh, will get good at throwing by trial and error over time, and they never can really self correct when the throw doesn't work. They're not really sure why. You right. know what I mean? And, and right. then and they get it again. I mean, they have a feeling for it, but then, and then it's hard for them to teach it because they're just like, do this. And then if the student's not doing whatever, they can't really, they can't really put their finger on it kind of. Thing. So I thought, well, you know, even people who, who are good, good at throwing, maybe it'll help them uh, just, just with um, having a, a great understanding of the, the actual principles behind it. And then I did it through the, from the point of view of the other person being thrown, like how you make them fall. And, and that's what I did. So that, that's how I put that together. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, you mentioned Aikido and, and when I came first came across the book many years ago, that's, that's the art that I was primarily training in and everything in the book was instantly recognizable to me, but it was, was put in a way that I, I couldn't necessarily put to myself. You, oh, you understand okay. what I mean? It was like, I couldn't quite verbalize the, 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 the principles that you had in there. So it was a big help. And, um, you know, you mentioned several people at the beginning of the book of that book um, that you would uh, trained with or learned from. And somebody I just wanted to talk about really quickly that I think doesn't get a whole lot of attention uh, is uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this man's name correctly or not. Is uh, Don Anjay. Is that how you pronounce his oh, name? Uh, yeah, Don Anjay. So I met Don. I never trained with Don. He was a fr I met him. Uh, he was a, fr a friend. And Don was a legit. Soke of an uh, old Aiki Jiu Jitsu lineage. Right. You know, he a Japanese gentleman in you know, New York. Like, like a movie, life's like a movie that way. Right. So I met Don through another friend. And uh, what I liked, the, the thing that, that, that I really liked about Don's teaching was um, Don, it was all principle based. Don, I mean, Don, Don was like the ultimate, like kind of left brained, very capable of explaining exactly how things work. Now he, you know, the IK did was, you know, I never learned it. It was completely different. And, and in all honesty, I wasn't really interested in learning the style. I was just fascinated by, you know, his, it, it was, it was what I, it was exactly why I, I'd looked at, you know, the things I'd done. Right. And Don was quite, you know, a lot older than me and had been doing it a long, long time. So um, Don, Don gave me, uh, you know, I was, I just started teaching then too. So he, Don gave me a lot of advice on, um, you know, like, teaching and running a, an academy and that kind of thing and and uh the the idea of of, of principle you know categorizing everything the principles so don, don so don didn't believe in key didn't believe in right. you know in, in all these things he just it was all i mean some of the things he could do like with the leverage seemed you know almost supernatural and right. he could yeah. explain every step and i was like i need to it was a catalyst for me i was like i need to explain things even better you know that you, it can be you know it's kind of like if you could run a four fifteen mile and you see the guy run, you know, Roger Bannister in the four minute, but you go, I can, if he can do that, I can, you know, I, I was a bit like, I can do that. So I, I, I kind of doubled down on my, on my analysis of things. I feel as a, as a teacher, that's what, that's where Don's influence came in. Yeah. yeah. And he that's was helpful. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So you came back to the United States uh, and then you um, sort of switched gears a little bit, or I guess it was probably a, for you, a, a natural progression, and, and you started with uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? How did you get started in Jiu-Jitsu? 
I came, I came back to the States to do a seminar. I was still living in Taiwan. I want, I want to say, I don't know. I can't, I just can't remember 92 maybe or something early nineties. And um, I was, I was, uh, I was in a Barnes and Noble looking at magazines and there was a black belt magazine. And it, I was looking at the end of the magazine. They used to have, you know, little ads for all this stuff. Yeah. And it was like a little like eighth page ad. And it's all it said was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, real fights. It was a, v, a VHS or whatever, right? I remember that. Yeah. And my first thought was, there's no such thing as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right? Said, real fights. So I bought it. You know, I, I I ordered it, right? Because and he, he had a picture of like, you know, someone on the ground getting punched in the head. So I was like, I'll buy that. So I bought it, and it was a Gracie in action one. Yeah. And I watched, and I was like, I need to learn this because ground fighting is, you know, sorely lacking in Chinese martial arts. You know, people be like, we have that. There, there's some, there's a little bit, there's some self-defense, you know, like Sui Chuan has a little bit, but there's nothing, you know, to compare to like real grappling arts. So I'd been on the ground in fights. So, you know, yeah. I was like, uh, this is something I'd like to learn. So the next time I came back, I, I told one of my friends that actually uh, taught Sun Tzu at the time and done some other things. And uh, I showed him the video and he was uh, a really big, strong guy. He was like a, a, he was a doorman at a bar and he was, you know, he was a badass, he, like a real badass. Right. So I went back to Taiwan and I came back maybe a year later and I, I you know, I, I contacted him and he was already a blue belt jujitsu. Like I was like, what? So he, after I showed him the video, his first response was, ah, they couldn't take me down. Yeah. And I was like, no, nah, I think they probably could. Yeah. So anyway, he went to the Gracie Academy and uh, did the Gracie challenge. He's like, I want to challenge you guys. And since he was a big, strong guy, they brought Hicks and Gracie out, who's the, oh, wow. the premier grappler of, right. of his generation. Right. And, and my friends, like literal work, you know, this is after a whole lifetime of doing Kung Fu and, and other martial arts and fighting. And he said, he looked at Hickson and he said, you know, this guy might beat me. But he said, in my wildest dreams, I had no idea how fast it would be. The whole fight was under 15 seconds. He got double legged and choked unconscious. Yeah. So he just signed up. So he started yeah. training like, like the next day kind of thing. So when I got back, he was already training. So he introduced me to... Uh, the, his teacher at the time and that's so I, I that's how I started and then a couple of years later when I came back uh, I started to train full-time and also for me it was good it was another avenue of competition you yeah. know I started competing in jiu-jitsu tournaments and then submissions grappling and you know we went from there so it was uh you know that that aspect of it I really liked as well I um friend of mine recently asked me a question and he asked me to define an internal martial art and I kind of was surprised that I had a hard time doing that um as as far as what differentiated it from you know so-called external martial arts but you know in thinking about that I wanted to ask you do you consider Brazilian jiu-jitsu an internal martial art because I feel like it does have a lot of the um uh, features or characteristics that the internal martial arts also have yeah, good. You know, other people ask me this question. Like always, it depends on your definition of internal. Right. Sure. Like you ask a hundred, you know, internal practitioners, you get a hundred damn different answers, kind of thing. So for me, my experience with actually training, you know, with the masters of it. So I have my own idea of it, you know, based on my experience. And uh, if you want to use it as a label, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is more internal than a lot of people that do. Chinese internal for real. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way they practice it. So, so if you, if you have parameters, um, I, I mean, it, martial arts, I, I think I wrote this in one of the books. you there's only people moving around, right? Right. You know what I mean? Right. So it, 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 it's hard to define these things. You see, that's all external style. That's an intro. That's a, it's, it's two guys moving around and they're, they're, they're generating force and they're doing technique. Uh -huh. So I don't, I, you know, the, the longer I train, the less I like the labels. Yeah. Um, I understand them though, because, uh, people want to, you want to categorize things so that, that you can define them and then you can explain them. I understand, you know, the problem then, then becomes you have to agree on definitions yeah. and that then, then it's, 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 you know, it's not an exact science. Like you're, you're counting, uh, you know, molecules in a substance or something, you know, you, so I, I you know, I, I don't, it's kind of like, if you close your eyes and a Tai Chi master kicks you in the balls and then you close your eyes and a karate master kicks you in the balls, could you tell the difference? I don't know. Right. They're both not a kick. I don't so, want to find out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I feel like there are different principles on martial arts. I mean, some martial arts have different body mechanics and they try to generate force differently or whatever. So if you want to, if you want to look at from that, from that aspect, you know, we can maybe get on the same page. 
Yeah. I want to talk about uh, chi power and energies, and I don't know. I'm not a medical. I'm not a Chinese doc, I'm doctor. I, I don't. I don't. It, there's no place for that in my instruction uh, right. because you can't. No one knows what it is. You can't feel right. that. You say they do, and it's all subjective. I can't. I mean, your kinesthetic sense is subjective, but I need things that that I can explain to you and demonstrate, and you can repeat. Right. That's what I need for you to learn things. Later on, you know, you can come up with your own feelings. So. Um, if you're talking about not using force against directly against force, right. you're talking about using structure over brute force. You're talking about using leverage over brute force. You're talking about a strategy that that is geared towards uh, getting superior position, so you can use your your great your whole body force against their isolated body force. Those would be in my definition of internal, and they're 100 percent exactly what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu will teach. So in that case, yes. If you want to have another definition, uh, you know, uh, maybe no, I don't know. You know, it depends. Yeah, that's kind you. of what I was getting at. I I think um, do uh, your current jujitsu students and MMA students, when you show them something that, that's maybe new to them that comes from Chinese martial arts, do you tell them that's where it comes from? Or are you just sort of like, sure. sometimes they, they love it It's because it suddenly becomes super exotic. Really? Yeah. Because, you know, that we do, you know, judo, it's Japanese and judo is right. com common and, right. you know, jiu-jitsu, so, um, like the other day, we I was showing, uh, in a, it was a submission to grappling class. It, it's it's a Chinese um, technique to, to uh, counter an arm drag, like a wrestling arm drag, and it's not common. I've never I never learned it when I wrestled. I never, it, you know, it's just something I learned in the Bagwajan, right? Nice. And uh, you know, I had I didn't say anything. I was teaching, and one of the guys was like, he goes, "No, this is pretty cool. It's like I never saw this before." And I go, "Oh, that's from Chinese martial arts." And then you get the collective, whoa. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like somehow, somehow sticking your arm into the guy's armpit is exotic now because it's Chinese, you know, it's something different. So I do sometimes, but, you know, for the most part, throws are throws. You know, I, I do point it out. Some of the throws are that I learned are specifically Chinese. You know, I give, I try to give credit where credit's due to all my teachers, you know, not every, not every technique, but, you know, in general. So if something specifically Chinese, I learned from someone, I give it, I give, I'll give it, you know, I'll give credit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, most of my, you know, most of my, jiu-jitsu students and my mma fighters i mean they know about my background but they they have no they they if i said xing yichuan in class tonight they they have no idea what i'm talking about yeah. they don't talk about it there's no point right we're they're mma fighters so you know we box we 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 you know we do takedowns obviously some might be chinese and then we ground fight you know there's no uh now the body method is you know they're similar anyway i mean they're fundamentally the same but the body method that i teach is what i learn from from my, my Chinese father so obviously that's there it's just inherent in everything I teach yeah so that's in there already and and you know some of the strategies and things but it's still uh uh to me it's it all goes together now I, I have private students and I do seminars I teach specifically just Chinese martial arts right so that's but in my my classes it's you know it's jujitsu it's it's it's, right. it's it's they already had all that have you ever had a jiu-jitsu student or an MMA student come to one of your private classes, your your Chinese martial arts classes, because they were their interest was piqued by something that you showed them and said, "Hey, this is from Xingyi or this is from Bagua." Did that, does that ever happen? Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, there's quite I've had quite a few. I had my from my best Xingyi students ever were uh, I had a, a small group of guys, and they'd all they were all. Uh, maybe blue belt and up at the time. So they'd all done jujitsu at least a couple of years, some up to eight or 10 years and they'd all boxed. And they, they literally, my first, my first black belt in jujitsu, uh, practiced Bagua with me first. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, so he would talk about the body method and things cause he, he, he was their primary teacher first. And then they came to me and said, Oh, we want to learn like Xing Yi, the Xing Yi trend. And we, they trained with me that, that group probably, I don't know, four or five years. And, uh, you know, they loved it. I mean, they already had a ground fight and they knew how to box. Right. Um, it was fun because also they were, they knew how to train and they were uh, willing to spar every class. Like, you know, for me, it was like the old days. So right. yeah, those guys literally came, came to it because they, they were just, they were interested. Right. Now, it's not, and it's not, it's not, it's not the majority, you know, they right. just, you know, they teach. Right. But some of them do. Yeah. And that's great that they're open-minded yeah. about that sort of thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. The thing about, you know, the, here's the thing about people who actually fight or, or compete in combat sports Nobody cares where it comes from, but it helps them win. So that's the whole idea of mixed martial arts, right? There would right. be no mixed martial arts if people were closed-minded. They'd all right. be doing their same styles, and, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu would be beating them all still kind of thing. Right, yeah, yeah. So 
they, you know, th this is the other thing about pressure testing. So we started off like the UFC with style against style. Mm -hmm. And within, I don't know, a couple of years, it was already at MMA, right? We saw very quickly what really worked. Right. And then people combine those things together and you can emphasize one over the other. And there'll be, there'll be, you know, some, some students will bring a little karate from their background or a little whatever, but primarily you train in, in the combat sports that uh, have been, you know, it's, it's going to be Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, wrestling, boxing, kick, you know, some more time. Right. That, well, and if you, if you st stop and analyze it for just a few seconds, every single one of those is a sport. Yeah. So, You'd be like, what about all the deadly martial arts? They can't beat them in general because they don't spar hard because they're too deadly or whatever their right. excuse is, right? <laughs> so you get you get sport martial arts where you're really fighting and the level goes up, right? Everyone understands how it really works. They don't know how to train correctly. So every single martial art that became a, a, a foundation of MMA is a sport. So yeah. does that mean that doesn't mean that the other martial arts don't quote unquote work? It means the methodology is incorrect or it's not enough the, the, you know, punching and kicking and, and Muay Thai might be identical to the punching and kicking in some traditional Asian martial art, but why didn't that traditional, traditional Asian martial art, you know, why didn't they pass the test? They didn't, they don't spar. It's not a sport. So they're, they're doing it in the air or they're doing it, pulling their punches or in a kata. It's methodology. So a lot of people will discount traditional styles and say, well, they don't work. It's like, mm, they work. They, they have everything they need. They're just not training correctly. Just like if you said, look, um, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu solo exercises all day. And then once a week, I, I do, uh, you know, I practice set techniques cooperatively with a guy. You couldn't fight either. You'd say, right. oh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu doesn't work, right? It's, right. It's, and that, the whole thing I talked about, the laboratory of training, you got to find out, you need to find out what you can really do. And you can't do that without pressure testing. So, you know, that's, if, if, any technique that I would bring in from a traditional style that I learned, they think my students with my MMA fighters, they would, they think it's great if it worked. Right. They're not going to go, well, that's not judo. They, right. they wouldn't occur to them. If you, if you, if somebody showed up one day with, you know, some, you know, crazy training methodology that just seems ridiculous and you kick the MMA fighters, all their asses, they would all do it. Sure. You just have to prove it works though. You can't, you can't say, well, this is, if you do this long enough, X, Y, Z will occur. You have to prove it. Right. Right. That leads, me, that leads me to a question that I wanted to ask you. So what, let's just say that we're taking, you know, traditional Chinese martial arts by themselves. What do you think? Obviously there's more, there's more uh, benefits to, to training in, in, in a martial art or a traditional martial art than just, you know, uh, fighting or self-defense. But what, what do you, what do you see as the, what do you see as the future of, of traditional Chinese martial arts just taken in and of themselves? Um, I think it's already about done. Yeah. Now, even when I was in Taiwan, there was a, kind of a demarcation between um, what we would think of as traditional. People do a lot of form. They have health practices. They mm -hmm. may do some technique. And then there was guys who wanted to fight. And back when I was in Taiwan, there was no MMA yet. So what people would do is cross train. They did mm -hmm. MMA. So right. a lot of the the... the, the well, there was some, you know, Chinese kind of early sound out where people would box a little, but a lot of guys would, they would do something. They might box for their hands. They might do Taekwondo and kick a little bit. Everyone did some Swai Jiao, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of would put these things together, but what they, but they went to, they went to styles with whatever aspect they were looking for. They actually sparred with some. So, and then they put it together and that was already forming now. I mean, if you go to Taiwan, I have a black belt there that teaches Jiu Jitsu and, and, um, you know, I go back to do seminars. When I look at the way it is, it's the same, but it's it's a bigger almost gap. Young young people who want to do anything combative, it doesn't occur to them to do Xing Yu. They they I mean they probably heard of it, but right. they just they think that's traditionally do forms and they go do BJJ or they go to an MMA academy. Mm -hmm. And then people who don't really want to fight, but like there's really a couple camps of that. There's like people who don't they really like Chinese. I mean, we all do, right? You know, we, you and I do. We like China. It's cool. We like the history. We like the culture. We like the philosophy. You know, we like the traditional idea. We like forms, and that's that's enough, though. If they don't really want to learn how to really defend themselves, and and uh, they do it as it's like a cultural thing, and you know, you get in shape, and and you're you're learning, especially for the Chinese, a part of their culture, right? Right. And you know, you might learn some self defense skills, but they're not going to fight in the ring. They're like, well, I don't, I'm not a fighter fighter. 
the unfortunate thing is you're going to get people doing the same thing and then, you know, think they can really fight or I beat the MMA guy in a real fight, you know, you, they're deluded and that's dangerous because they get hurt if they got to fight, right. you know, or they tried to, so you have to be clear on why you're, why you're doing it. Right. But now I feel like there's not going to be many young people who are going to go to a traditional style to learn how to fight because even if you did, like, like I did, I learned Xing Yitran, Xing Yitran, I learned Bagua, it worked just fine. You know, the way we trained standing up, I still couldn't fight on the ground. I had to learn jiu-jitsu. Right. So now you would be like, why would I spend years here, years that I could just go to an MMA academy and learn it all, you know, and it's all, I don't have to learn a, a lot of superfluous stuff or what I'm, what I might view as superfluous and I could just learn the fight part. So they're going to be always going to be people like traditional styles and they're going to be the people, those kind of people. And the people that want to fight are going to do MMA or right. JJ or Muay Thai or box or something. Right? right. I feel like, or Sanda, if you're in China, you know, you just go learn Sanda. Right. Yeah. Like if you said to any young man, it's like, look, you know, you're going to be, you're going to live someplace where you're going to be brawling all the time. You need to learn some self-defense. You're not going to learn Tai Chi in the park with somebody. He's going to learn right. something. Right. It's not going to occur to him, right? right? So I feel like that's, it's pretty much the future is now, you know. Yeah. So you just need to be clear on why, you know, why you're doing what you do. Sure. So uh, your your life, at least to somebody like me, you know, like a, like a Kung Fu nerd, uh, you know, is pretty, pretty exciting life. You know, you, you've done a lot of things. You've trained with a lot of people, you know, you, you've traveled a lot. Um, and you're you're a good writer too. Uh, so is it, is it, have you ever thought about like writing a memoir at some point in the future? Obviously, you're still doing things now, but yeah, uh, you know, you know, I, you know, it's interesting. I mean, maybe yeah, from the outside, you know, I had had kind of an unconventional life, and I did, you know, I did like if you like kung fu, you know, it, it's probably interesting. You know, right. I went to China and Taiwan, I did all those things. I don't know though. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, how many people would really be interested in reading about my, you might my be life. Surprised. If I did, if I did write something like that, I think it'd be more about, you know, um, my teachers, right? If, you know, that kind of thing with me because I was there rather than like me, this is what I did. Yeah. I feel like that, that would be much more interesting to, to most people. And I would feel like it would be a better contribution than, you know, yeah. be stories about my awesome self. You know what I mean? So um, maybe one day, there. yeah, maybe one day. So are, are you working on anything currently as far as like uh, writing or, or, or videos yeah, I or anything of sort? No, I, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been writing much lately. So maybe I thought about it. I thought about, uh, I, I thought, I thought about some things I might do. And now, yeah, I just teach full time. I travel a fair amount and I have, you know, spent a fair amount of time with like the pro MMA fighters and that, that takes a lot, those kind of things, um, you know, just, just teaching classes and things are, you know, uh, I mean, it's my job, it's the job, but when you have fighters are in camp and things, it takes a lot of time, you know, or, I mean, I, I enjoy doing it, but it takes, a, it takes a lot of, and even at the time, it's a lot of energy, like a lot of, you know, it's hard, it would be hard for me just to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write something. When I wrote things, it was a slow process. I, I would kind of write it and rewrite it. And I, I, don't, I would want to, if I did it, I would want to do it that way. So maybe in the future, you know, yeah. right now, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't really thought about doing anything uh, in the near future okay well tim i really thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me today yeah. and you know anytime you ever want to come back obviously and promote anything that you got coming up you know please feel free to do so appreciate it yeah it was, it was fun thank you very much it's been a pleasure thanks tim